It's sometime in the mid-1980s, and I'm somewhere close to 10 years old. My father and I are helping my older half-sister, Mara, move from Bard College, where she'd recently graduated, to a shitty apartment on the Lower East Side on Ludlow Street. My father is putting bars on her window. As I'm quite young, I'm not helping him with that, but I'm inside helping Mara unpack her books. She has Nan Golden's Ballad of Sexual Dependency. This image is on the cover, and it strikes me immediately. For me, that book embodies all of the louche glamour, the tension, the pain, and the pleasure of living in downtown New York in those years. And it reminded me so much of my sister and her friends. I had always idolized her growing up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and here she was in this city, living the life of the downtown ingenue. The book is full of painful imagery, of, ten, of relationships full of discomfort, drug use, violence, but also, again, so chic. It was later that I discovered that the artist adds to this. It is a slideshow, first and foremost, that was constantly in, um, in development throughout those years. And images of tenderness also appear, this one taken some years later, in the later 80s. An image that I didn't think was possible in those years. An image of such tenderness between two men that was not to be depicted, I thought. I had seen art that one theoretically wasn't supposed to look at before. Growing up in Philadelphia, I haunted the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where, in the galleries for Duchamp, lies a strange room and a strange door, a vintage one, apparently from some farmhouse or castle in Spain, through which Duchamp carved two peepholes. I was always tall enough to look through them, and if, when I did, I discovered something else that I wasn't quite sure I wanted to see. An image of strangeness and mystery, one that for us modern art historians embodies the avant-garde, but also for me as a child embodied the dangers, I think, of sexuality, the dangers of looking and seeing something you may not want to see. It's 1998, a full decade more or more later, and I'm back from college in California in that spring in Philadelphia, and I go back to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where I see this amazing installation by artist Zoe Leonard. It's called Strange Fruit for David. It encompasses the hundreds of fruit peels Zoe has eaten of the fruit Zoe has consumed over the past five years as she's mourning the loss of her dear friend, artist David Vonarovich. And in trying to deal with that pain, she has carefully sewn up each peel, adding zippers sometimes to the bananas, adding delicate threads of embroidery to each orange peel. And these fruits, as they were installed in that year in Philadelphia, scattered over the ground, each one a tiny skin, of a life that once was, of something that was cherished and is now lost, something made, or something attempted to be made whole again. David himself, David Vonarovich, took this image of his friend and lover, Peter Hujar, the photographer, on his deathbed in New York City a decade before. This is 1987. It's an image that is so difficult to look at, but yet so full of strange tenderness and pain. That year, or possibly the year before, the year after, I'm in my kitchen in the suburbs, and Mara is home from New York, and she's crying. And she's crying at once because her estranged mother has yet again stood her up for a lunch date in the city, but also because her best friend, Jeffrey, the artist is dying of AIDS in New York. It's 2005, and I'm finally in New York City. 
I've moved here to go to graduate school at NYU, and I'm working at NYU's Gray Art Gallery downtown on a show about New York in these very years, from 1974 to 84. And the curators are looking for this photograph by Peter Hujar. It's of Candy Darling on her deathbed in New York. How very different a decade, how very much difference a decade makes. 1974, the glamorous trans Warhol superstar Candy luxuriates in her hospital room, surrounded by flowers, speaking of, sort of reeking of all of the glamour of those Warhol years. Yet one feels, of course, the pull the pull of an imminent death, and for me it is a foreboding image, one that at once speaks to the inability of this kind of life to exist, and also a portent of what is to come. That same year, my boyfriend Stephen, who works for Doctors Without Borders, is traveling in southern China with a photographer from the New York Times. The photographer, Ashley Gilbertson, takes this picture of a woman at an AIDS clinic. She covers her face because she is not supposed to be seen, or she doesn't want to be seen. And the idea that one still lives and has to live, but yet has to hide, is a painful one. There are 35 million people living with HIV AIDS in this world. Life is different, perhaps, now, but there is, still, there is still this need to hide. It's now close to the present. I'm here. I'm working at the Met. I'm putting together a show with colleagues about Warhol's influence. But of course, much of this is during this period. And I'm trying to do some math. It's never been my strong suit. My parents thought otherwise. And I'm trying to figure out how much candy we need for this artwork by Felix Gonzalez Torres. It's from 1992. It's called Untitled, A Portrait of Ross in LA. It begins as a work of art with 175 pounds of tutti frutti candy. The visitor, though, is impelled or allowed to take a piece of candy, to put it in their mouth, in the galleries. 175 pounds is how much Ross, Felix's lover, weighed when he was at his best. Before AIDS began to eat away at his body, before he became the ske a skeleton, a different version of what he had been, and so in eating this candy, the visitor takes part in that disappearance as each day goes by and the curator can make the choice whether to replenish that pile every morning or every week or never, to have the work disappear as the day goes by, to have it come back and resurrect itself the next day. Well, that's what we decided. We would have it as full, beautiful Ross, beautiful, sweet Ross every morning. So how much candy did we need? How much would people eat? from that pile. How, we knew vaguely how many visitors there would be, but how many of them would actually partake of this bittersweetness. And it is this that art can do. It can complicate our notions of what participation in a process means, of what it means to look and feel and taste the things we don't necessarily want to taste or see or look at. It is in memory of people like Ross, like Peter, like David, like my sister's friend, Jeffrey, that I do what I do today. And it is because of them that I am always looking, always wanting to find images that are hard to see. Thank you.